Welcome back, everybody. This is the Prepared Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Austin, and have a really good episode coming to you guys this week. And it is, I promise it wasn't planned this way, but surprisingly very relevant with a lot of the current events going on. We're seeing these uh, wildfires and this, uh, it's not really a natural disaster because I think they just broke the news either today or yesterday that uh, the fires were caused by downed power lines and poor infrastructure. Not not exactly natural causes, right? But we're talking with uh, Trey. Trey is back on and we're talking about disaster relief. So a lot of Americans right now dealing with, I guess, the just the, the shockwave of what comes with, uh, you know, possibly losing your home, having to evacuate, things like that. And that's just in, in Maui, right? I know uh, here in Michigan, we've encountered some heavy storms. It was actually not really funny, but I guess I'm more, I'm more so ironic that after last week's discussion uh, with, uh, with Chris that, you know, we we're talking about water purification, and then we had some crazy storms here, and due to poor infrastructure here in Detroit, uh, Wayne County, which is the surrounding county there, actually uh, had to put out a uh, emergency notification not to use any water because there were issues with the pumps, and the water wouldn't be clean and, and sanitary and things like that. So we get into a lot of stuff today uh, with the, with this discussion, and you know, with so much going on, and we got tropical storms coming into you know parts of Florida and in the southern U.S. and everything. So certainly uh, not something I planned this way, but it just kind of worked out that that's what we're talking about. Uh, and certainly our our thoughts and our prayers, all the families that are impacted, and hopefully our our government uh, can get their shit together <clears throat> and figure out how to help those people, and our president can stop trying to compare you know these these awful fires, these uncontrolled fires that, that have done so much damage to the time he almost lost his precious Corvette in a kitchen fire of all things at his home. But I digress. Um, should be a really, really good discussion. Guys, before I get over to that, have to say thank you to all of our Patreon patrons. Actually just put a blog up today uh, about the new helmet I picked up, talking about my rationale and, and my first experiences with it. You know, sometimes I think the best time to, to write about some of those things is the very, you know, th- I say about three days, you know, cause we're busy. You don't have time to, to really play with something right away. So with, you know, three days or less to, uh, try a new product, try a new piece of kit, try a new piece of gear. So, uh, shout out to the Patreon patrons. Your guys support is awesome and it makes all of this possible without your support. The team would not be making the trip out to the HTA range day event, which if you guys are in the Pennsylvania area, I encourage you to sign up and check it out. It's a great opportunity to learn from some really, really good instructors. I know there's some courses that still have uh, spots available <clears throat> and it's only a uh, hundred dollars and all the funds go straight to deliver fun to combat human trafficking. Um, but also have to say thank you as we are a sponsored podcast here at Prepared Mindset for all of our awesome sponsors that support me, support the team here and everything that we're doing without their help, without their partnership. This wouldn't be what it is. Uh, to some extent, it may not even exist at this point. Certainly didn't expect three years ago to be where we're at today. So uh, with that, I need to say thank you to Custom Night Vision. Guys, if you haven't checked out Custom Night Vision, you really should. To start their pricing is second to none. You know, I think that when a lot of people talk about night vision, that is the first thing they put up as a, I'll say a roadblock or a speed bump to getting into night vision is it's too expensive. I can't afford to get into that. My wife will kill me. I don't have the money, whatever the case may be. They have affordable pricing that actually hasn't really gone up in the past year. I can honestly tell you as somebody who bought from a different company at Black Friday, thought I got a really great sale. I'm actually upset that I didn't know about Custom Night Vision at the time. I didn't look into their prices because what their prices are right now is what I got on sale during Black Friday. <clears throat> They're crazy competitive and they have everything you guys need. So whether you need a PVS 14, maybe you want one of the Tonto housings from Nocturne, maybe going for something lightweight, you want, you know, take this out hiking and, and hunting and things like that. All of those are available on their site, plus binocular models like the 1431s, RNVGs. They got all the good stuff there, and green phosphor, white phosphor, Elbit, L3, whatever you guys need, whatever you want, they carry it. And it doesn't stop there. If you want the whole package, you want to get into night vision, and you don't want to have to worry about it, you want to go helmet, you want mount, you want the tubes, you want everything shipped to you all at once. You can put it together like a freaking crazy awesome set of Legos and just go start LARPing with your friends. They carry helmets from OpsCore. 
they carry helmets from Team Wendy, and they carry all of the mounting hardware that's necessary to make this stuff come together and work. So whether that's a you know G24 mount from Wilcox, something you're going to use to carry your PVS-14 or your binos, whatever have you, they carry it. Surplus Rhino mounts with the J-arm, the, the bayonet-style J-arm that some people really like because that's just what they use in the service, they carry that as well. They have tons and tons of options, you guys. Anything you're looking for night vision related, there's a good chance they'll be able to take care of you. And if they don't have it, it's probably because they have a better solution. Lasers, flashlights, helmets, night vision, you name it. Head on over to customnightvision.com and check it out for yourself. Also, a huge shout out and a huge thank you to HRT Tactical Gear. Guys, <clears throat> been running their plate carrier for a while now, and I love the thing. Durability-wise, it's been great. Construction, quality, top notch up there with other companies that I've ran and worked with. It's the first question I get. Hey, how's the quality? Is it going to fall apart? And I get it. The stuff's expensive, but this is top notch gear guys. No problems whatsoever. And it has been supremely comfortable. Their L back carrier to me, for me, the adjustable back. I never honestly thought that I would like something like this and it has completely changed my mind. They also offer their rack and a track carriers. If you're looking for something a little bit more, you know, traditional in design, you like the, uh, you know, load bearing side cummer buns and things. Maybe those are a better fit for you. They also have a, a, so many options, placards. Uh, I run their Maximus and that thing is awesome. I fill it up with so much stuff, uh, snacks, notepads, pens. In addition to, yeah, I can carry three magazines for your AR. I can carry two pistol mags. You can check out their belts, mag pouches, and their AWLS weapon light just came back in stock. They got a whole bunch of those. You guys head on over to hrttacticalgear.com. Pick up some new gear for yourself today. Big shout out to our friends over at 100 Concepts as well. Huge supporter of ours and supporter of our Patreon patrons. Guys, head on over to 100concepts.com. Check out their uh, scope caps, their light caps. Scope Cap Pros just dropped, or actually they should be dropping uh, in the next week or so here. They just dropped for our Patreon patrons who got early access as a thank you for being supporters of the Prepared Mindset. You guys go check out our Patreon page. You can sign up and maybe you get access to the next big product drop that they have in the works. Otherwise, you guys can head on over, like I said, 100concepts.com. Their motto is do good, be dangerous, live free, and their products are great, guys. You know, they're working on enhancements to their regular scope caps to make them quieter. They're working on a, a shock collar system, it looks like, to, you know, retain things better than just using a ranger band that can wear out and, and break and get cut and things like that. I, I, I have their pack scrim, I have their helmet scrim. Super easy to set up, super easy to use great products the team over there is absolutely killing it they're getting picked up by trx arms and big tax ordinance guys head on over 100concepts.com and pick up some new gear today and lastly thank you to larp labs guys i don't know if you knew this some people jump straight in the firearms game and they don't not every company allows you to spray paint your product uh to paint your product to cerakote you know the products and honor a warranty there are companies out there that will sell you I don't know, uh, $1,000 plus laser units, for example, or optics. And if you deface them in any way, you lose your warranty, which sucks because we pay a lot of money for this gear. That's where LARP Labs comes in with their computer cut vinyl wraps. Guys, it's 3M vinyl, right? It is tough shit. It is what they use for competitive rock crawlers, for God's sake. It's not going to tear. It doesn't, you know, bubble or leak around the edges or uh, get that... That, that sticky residue that, you know, all, all of our decals and things get and eventually just take it off and you have to rub it down with goo gone. That is not how these work at all. They got a three-year outdoor shelf life. They're absolutely durable as hell. John and team do a fantastic job. You can head over to LARPLabs.com and check out everything they got going on. And they set up discount code, Prepared Mindset, for 10% off your order. So whether you're looking for something for your PVS-14, your laser, your flashlights, Whatever the case may be, LARP Labs has you guys covered. Head on over to LARPLabs.com and check it out today. So, like I said, uh, Trey's back. Uh, we had a really good conversation, you know, the last time he was on about gardening and uh, being able to, you know, produce and, and a lot of the homesteading things that I think people are very interested in when they look at trying to get away from the grid. I don't want to say off the grid because those people are an entirely different breed, but we talked a lot about gardening and community, and then we did get a bit into disaster relief in that discussion just because his community was, was hit pretty hard by a storm, and him and his group of friends that he trains with and does the stuff that we talk about a lot on this podcast, they were able to get together 
provide relief for the community until power was restored and things like that. So that's something I think that, unfortunately, like I said, right now is very, very applicable. There's so much of it going on across the country. I don't even know how this happened. You know, uh, Hawaii, like I said, uh, the uh, Southeast United, United States is getting hit. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, Hillary just went through and, and hit the West Coast. We've had storms and flooding of the, the roads and things all over here in Michigan. It's just been absolutely crazy over the last couple of weeks, guys. I feel like the summer has just been, unfortunately, one one mess after another. So uh, possibly a very pertinent conversation for a lot of you guys. And, and one I think you'll you'll learn a lot from, but also enjoy. It's always, it's always great when I get to connect with Trey and have a conversation with him. So I'm really looking forward to that. So without any further delays here, I am just going to cut it on over to our discussion on disaster relief. Trey, welcome back, man. How you doing? Hey, doing good. Good to uh, be on again. Yeah, man. I'm happy that we have the opportunity to kind of follow up uh, and, and I guess expound on the the previous conversation when you were on. I know we talked that uh, that discussion was mostly around uh, community and and gardening and homesteading to to an extent and and sustainment and things like that with food. And we kind of briefly in that discussion got to touch a little bit on uh, disaster relief, which I know you and, and several of your friends, your, uh, I believe you guys are like a training group. You guys, I've, I know I've taken classes at like Darcy and stuff together with, uh, John over at LARP labs and whatnot. Um, but you touched on that just a little bit last time. And I thought it'd be, you know, it'd be really cool to sit down and talk about it again. Ironically, as we're dealing with the crazy fires in Maui and hurricanes on both coasts and the Midwest, I, I can't remember the last time we've had this bad of weather in the Midwest. Uh, I mean, we used to get hail here in Michigan, like once every three or four years, like we've had it like three times and it was the size of golf balls. Um, I got to be on my phone. So, I mean, at any rate, uh, there's plenty of disaster stuff going on. So I, uh, wasn't planned this way, but certainly I think a conversation, a lot of people are gonna be able to relate to, right. With everything that's going on right now. No, absolutely. I, Disaster relief is kind of my original passion. It's what got me into more of this lifestyle. Um, actually, Katrina was really, I was about 15, 16 when Katrina hit. Um, definitely dox myself as far as age, but whatever. Um, but when Katrina hit, that was a wake-up call to me that natural disasters are significant. They are real. They are life-altering. And I know for Katrina, I had a lot of friends that lived through Katrina or um, that, that evacuated Arkansas. Arkansas, which is where I live, was one of the big states that accepted evacuees. Um, our, our governor at the time was a pastor and really believed that it was our duty to welcome our neighbors. Um, that was a sentiment that a lot of people felt, and I know I did. Mm -hmm. A lot of issues as well. Um, it, was a, it was a mixed bag, and we still suffer from a lot of those issues to this day. Um, but yeah, that was kind of my foray into disaster work. And I just decided from there on, man, this is something I'm passionate about that God has uniquely gifted me to do. And I had a lot of friends that were into it. So I said, you know what, let's, let's double down on this. Yeah. And I mean, I was about the same age actually when, <laughs> when Katrina uh, hit, because I remember, um, I got, I got community service hours in high school for helping, uh, I guess just load semi trailers. There were like strategic parking lots across the counties here in Michigan where they would set up the the, the government set up drop off points. If you want to drop off, you know, uh, cases of water and toilet paper and uh, hygiene products and stuff, you could drop it off here, and they would have a couple empty semi trucks with people just. And all you did was load stuff on. People were lined up dropping stuff off. It was uh, simultaneously one of the most like. I guess I don't, maybe heartwarming, you know, that like that people cared that much uh, while also like one of the most grounded experiences uh, of my, I guess, adolescent years. Right. Because, hey, th there's a whole ton of stuff here and it's not, you know, when you realize it's not going to go very far because of how bad some of these things can get. Um, and it kind of, you know, when you're younger, you take a lot of stuff for granted. I, we, we still do now, uh, you know, running water and whatnot, but when you, when it's gone, right. It kind of changes everything. And, um, so I'm with you. I, I, I remember that. I think a lot of people have forgotten the impacts, uh, of, of Katrina. And, um, certainly that's a, that's a large scale disaster, right. Kind of along the lines of what we're seeing in Maui, but certainly smaller disasters, I would say are often overlooked, certainly can be as impactful to families 
And, you know, I know there's a lot that goes with that. I think people think, oh, well, if I just say thoughts and prayers online and then <laughs> drop off a case of water someplace, I'm doing my part. And it helps. Well, the water helps. I don't know if the thoughts and prayers bit posted online, you know, really does anything. As long as you're, if you're actually praying, then good on you. You know what I'm saying? But I don't know. I, I think a lot of people just jump on the bandwagon for that stuff. They don't actually, you know, go out their way to try and participate. Yeah, I think, I think there, there are, there are different responses to disasters. And I think that's what, that is what is difficult about figuring out what your response is supposed to be. I, I know for me, every time a hurricane, like the current one that is bearing down on Florida, when this is being recorded, I, every hurricane that hits, I always want to go down and get involved and I want to help. But what I have to realize is I can only, I'm one person uh, out of 322 million Americans. I can only go do so many things. Um, and two, one of the things we got into this a little bit last time, I'm going to save this topic. I want to get into this later. Um, but I'll, I'll, the way a lot of people know how to help is to give uh, things. Uh, mm-hmm. We, we oh, what's the term I'm looking for? We know how to consume. And I yeah. think that that is uh, that is a multifaceted aspect of disasters. Um, but yeah, I, that is one of those subjects that's touchy and hard to kind of digest as far as how do you help? And, you know, again, I've said this in the last podcast, um, uh, I'm a believer and it's one of those things where, you know, I do mock and make fun of a lot of the thoughts and prayers because they're not genuine and they don't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know for me, like, there have been disasters where my entire church has gotten together and we're like, Hey, we're going to pray for this. And especially stuff overseas. We can't afford to send a team with semi trucks and equipment overseas to help right. with something. Right. Um, we can't send money, which we do often. But the one thing we can is we can, we can let those people know, Hey, we're praying for them. Cause I can tell you if somebody's lived through a disaster, uh, knowing all these people were texting me going, Hey man, thinking about you today or Hey, I'm praying for you. Or, hey, I know today's going to be a hard day. Y'all got a lot on your plate. Just want to let you know that, you know, our family's lifting you up and that kind of stuff, man, it, it is, it's, it's that, it's that intangible, um, kind of that, that thing in the background that really helps push you through hard stuff. Um, it really takes you to this, this mental state that makes you go, okay, Hey, I can handle this no matter how hard it is. Yeah. And you know, I think there's, there's something to be said for, for being able to, or, or trying to help and, and contribute. But yeah, I mean, like you said, a lot of people, it's not genuine. Um, and it, it, I don't know. It almost, it's, you do it just because everyone else is doing it. Um, when in reality, there's a lot of things you can do in situations where there's, uh, I mean, we use the term disaster. It doesn't always have to be something, uh, catastrophic, right? It can be something as simple as like here in Michigan over the last couple of days, we've had, I mean, well, actually all summer, we've had crazy storms. I don't know why, but we've had, a, it's been an awful summer for us. And due to infrastructure problems with the just amazing city of Detroit, right? Uh, basically all of Wayne County lost clean water for a couple of days. Wayne County is the county Detroit's in and something like that where you're just going out of your way to help collect or distribute bottled water or, you know, stuff like that, or, you know, taking people into, you know, uh, a neighboring church or something and helping facilitate things like, uh, you know, bathrooms and stuff like that and hygiene products since you don't have running water for a couple of days. Yeah. Like those things can be tremendously impactful and it doesn't take a whole lot of time. doesn't take a whole lot of effort to, to do that. It doesn't take a whole lot of money in some instances. Um, those are the things I think people should focus more on, let alone what, you know, what people think of when we say disaster relief, which is, I think more to the point of this, like flash flooding, tornadoes, um, earthquakes, uh, wildfires, things like that, right. Where they're tremendously impactful and people are displaced from their homes and potentially don't even have a home, you know, anymore. Um, so how did you, you know, past Katrina, when did, when did you get started at, like actively getting involved with the disaster relief efforts? Yeah, I'll kind of carry, carry the audience through from when that started all the way up until the tornado, because that's kind of when everything really culminated. I decided to get involved in 2008, a one of the longest, I think I'm remembering this right, the longest track tornado in Arkansas history hit. 
and it hit a lot of rural communities, especially up in the Ozark region of Arkansas. And if you know anything about the Ozarks, it's a lot of hillbillies, a lot of good old boys, good old <laughs> girls that know how to take care of themselves, but not when a tornado hits. Um, it's it's devastating. It's really, truly devastating. And I was in high school, had a lot of really cool friends at the time. I was also a mechanic, and I was getting ready to graduate high school. Worked in a mechanic shop with a bunch of guys that were really uh, capable, had a lot of skill sets. And then one of my best friends at the time, who I was actually going to college with, uh, he was a little bit older than I was, he had a lot of skills when it came to storm cleanup and he was actually a trained storm spotter. And we just decided, man, we're going to spend every weekend up there. Um, my parents were really cool growing up. They did not set a lot of limits and rules on me because I never broke the rules. In fact, yeah. actually doing tornado cleanup was the only time I had broken the rules. I got to speak. Oh, really? Um, but I, I didn't break the rules. I, I obeyed, I obeyed their boundaries. And as a result, I got, infinite and unlimited freedom to do whatever I wanted. And what I wanted to do was load up my truck with tools and go help people across the state. And it was super fun. I really enjoyed it. We had, we had four or five back-to-back tornadoes that year and every single one was pretty, pretty devastating. And right. it, it just hammered us that spring. 2008 was a hard year. It started February 5th and it went all the way until, until May or early June. We just got hammered with tornadoes. And so I got, I kind of got my feet wet, but what I started realizing was in 2011, we had another bad tornado hit a town called Valonia. And then subsequently after that tornado hit, we had flooding rains that also flooded the town of Valonia. It was really bad. We had a lot of flooding rains in 2011. And so it was one of those, it was one of those situations where I started realizing I need credentials. I need a badge I can flash something that says, Hey, I'm legitimate yeah. because as much as I despise certification culture, I listened to a great podcast recently about this. We, we live in a certification culture that wants to see a badge that wants to see an ID that wants to see a wall full of useless pieces of paper that says, you know, I'm really good at you know, cheating at stuff on the internet. And somehow it makes you knowledgeable. Yeah. That's the but, assumption, right? Yeah. Correct. But I do understand there are some of those programs that are fantastic. And when it comes to disaster relief, the majority of those programs are good. So we had a tornado hit in 2014 that for me was really life changing. Um, I had friends die in that tornado, people who I'd grown up with, including um, somebody that mentored me as a kid. Um, I'm not going to talk about their names, et cetera. They, they like to live a very private life, um, but it was national news. Um, and it was devastating. Um, children, wives, husbands, older folks. We lost 17 people in that tornado and hundreds were injured. It was catastrophic. It was the only tornado I've actually ever seen in person too, because I was foolishly, I got in my truck and I chased after it. Um, wow. Which actually turned out to be a good thing because I was one of the first people that came across block roads. So I was able to report that on Twitter um, at the time. And I helped clean up. I was in a weird position where I didn't have work. Um, I was, I was running a small car wash, but I only worked part time. I'd come out of being very, very sick for almost a year. I was trying to rebuild my strength and I just doubled down, man. And I, I went all in on cleanup because these are my friends. These are people I knew. Um, this is yeah. a place I grew up going to as a kid. And I got put in touch with uh, Caterpillar, the guys that make the road graders, like some of their executive oh, wow. people just yeah. called me one morning at like 7.30. Um, a large nationally known disaster relief group, um, all of these big corporations somehow got my phone number. I have no idea how, because I was very private about my contact information at this time. And they said, hey, we want to help out. We hear you're the guy, you know, how can we help? And I was like, well, I'm not the guy. This is actually all being led by this rural church. Yeah. But I said, I will help facilitate this, get you in touch with them, and I'll be accountable for all the equipment that comes out. And so we spent about, I spent close to five months, but really six weeks of just bearing down multiple times a week, every weekend, helping clean up. And coming out of that, I realized I needed to get certifications. I realized that that was going to be a problem when I encountered roadblocks and encountered police officers and disaster management folks. 
So in 2015, they'll, they'll, they'll turn people back, right? Like they're trying to keep those areas clear of people as best they can. So yeah, yes, I mean, which I, that's... which I entirely respect. Um, yeah. I, they're there to do a job and they do it well. Um, that said, it's frustrating when I have a skill set and I can't get through to help people. And right. so in 2015, I doubled down and I decided I'm going to do all the training. I was single. I was not in college. I was working a painfully boring job at the time that did not excite me and left me with a reasonable amount of free time. It was only about four days a week. And so I pursued every bit of training that I could from the FEMA CERT program, going to insert like a little one and a half minute plug here. CERT is the name of the program. CERT is one of the best free training programs that you can do. Um, it's, it takes about a month to take the classes. You do it like two or three nights a week. And then you have to devote a whole Saturday to a, a, a scenario. Um, a lot of places it's fairly funded, especially if you live out West, this program is huge out West. Um, it's also big out East. Um, I got lucky. I did have to drive an hour one way every day for training. Um, but it was yeah. worth it because it was free. I got medical training, um, uh, earthquake, search and rescue, comms, all this stuff. And I took, I, I took it with some friends of mine. One of those guys who's actually a, has a his master's in disaster relief or disaster management, um, as a police officer, all that kind of stuff. That's it's really, really that's, um, You can get a degree in disaster management. I had no idea. You can get a map. You get a master's. There's only two colleges in the United States, Arkansas Tech, which is one of my alma maters, and a college in Maryland, if I remember right. Um, I wanted to do that degree program, but I went to school in 2009. And if anybody remembers what was happening to the economy, then everybody and their mom and their dad and their siblings were going to college. So I didn't have enough. They didn't have enough room in the program, sadly, and I didn't have good counseling. But all that to say, CERT's fantastic program. You need to look into it. And the other program that is actually nationwide, a lot of people don't know this, they're actually worldwide now, it's called Southern Baptist Disaster Relief. You do need to be at a Baptist church to be a part of this um, or or adjacent to a Baptist church. They have started branching out to non-denominational, but they are a federally FEMA-recognized organization. Um, Their training is $30 for every training session or $30 or $40 I'm actually having to re-up because mine expired. So I'm having to do that next month. I'm having to cut my vacation short. I'm not happy about it, but it's just how life is. They are a fantastic organization. They get a ton of money from local Baptist churches, from different organizations, and they get a lot of they get a lot of support from the Baptist Convention, the, the Southern Baptist Convention. They go worldwide with their stuff, but they really focus in on the U.S. I am spoiled. Here in the South, uh, we have the best organizations. Um, Arkansas, Florida, Texas, Tennessee, Oklahoma, they're some of the biggest disaster relief organizations. They own fleets of equipment. Um, they own they, – they, I'll put it this way. Uh, the Texas uh, – it's called Texas Men's. Uh, the Texas Men's Baptist Association for Disaster Relief can walk into small towns and they mm-hmm. can uh, purify water. They can power the town. They can run showers. They can run a, a food kitchen, um, a distribution point, et cetera, for thousands of people every single day without wow. a hitch. Um, That's it, impressive. Is in, it is so cool to watch them do it. I've, I've gotten to be an observer a couple of times. Um, and keep in mind, it's, it's all done by a bunch of folks on the age like 65, um, which is <laughs> in, incredible, but that's a great organization. Um, there are a few others. So I got involved in that I actually started the, I helped start the first non-denominational Southern Baptist disaster relief organization. Um, we trained in one training, we trained over 150 volunteers, which was the largest training that ever had in the history of disaster relief. Mm-hmm. Um, that tornado really invigorated a lot of people to, to get involved. And so that, that is a great organization. Going to shout out a couple more. Um, the Mennonites have a fantastic organization. I don't know much about it because the Mennonites are more of a closed community, which is okay. Um, that is what they choose to do, but they have, they have a great disaster relief. The Methodists have a fantastic disaster relief group. Um, they, they're small, but each 
each state had or, or an estate adjacent has something like that. And then lastly, Church of Christ has a disaster relief group. And um, I don't know much about them. This is the first time I've encountered them, but they are awesome. Um, and I was really surprised at the resources. So all I have to say, that's when I started doubling down on training was in 2015 after that big tornado. And I did it all. I mean, I was at every training session for years. Um, if if I had my Baptist ID, oh, here, I actually, I, you can't see this because you're not on camera, but uh, Austin can see this. Uh, I actually have endorsements yeah. missing. Like I'm almost out of room on the back of my card. Um, <laughs> this is something that's really important to me um, to, to get that training. And so I started taking every online course, Southern Baptist disaster relief, medical class. And then I started going out and working on chainsaw a lot and working equipment. I purposely sought out jobs that would put me in an arena or in a career that I knew would also help with disaster relief and just living a more prepared life, but also make me money because I noticed that's what a lot of other guys in this do. So they would be plumbers by day. And then on the weekends they would go um, run equipment um, mm -hmm. or they would, we have a lot of guys actually sell chainsaws or sell heavy equipment. And then they do this in their free time. So okay. that's how I got involved and never got to deploy with, Southern Baptist disaster relief because after I was done doing a lot of training uh, for a couple of years, I stepped into a life stage where at the time I was married, I was in college. My, my then wife was in college. And so I did not get to deploy at all, um, which I was, I was bummed about, but Arkansas stayed relatively quiet. We didn't have a lot of disasters outside of windstorms um, and the occasional flood. And then came 2019, we had a big, mm -hmm. big flood, the Arkansas river flooded. And that was, that was big. I got to be involved in that to a limited extent. Um, but then came 2023 and this year has been the mother of all years for disasters from, I mean, we, we came out of Christmas time with a horrible freeze that left a lot of people without water, burst pipes, um, killed people. Um, cause again, yeah, our, yeah. our Kansans are not used to zero degrees. That's not normal down here. Oh, that's, that's, um, we're, we're good with it up here in Michigan. We get that all the time. That's like nothing. I mean, it, no, it's not nothing, but like, we're, we're just used to it. <laughs> yeah. Y'all, your, your houses are actually insulated for up there, insulated for it up there. Yeah. So yeah. we, we, we come into that lots of rain and then it's like tornado, 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 hail storms. And I'm talking about stuff like biblical plague kind of hailstorms. Um, we got a hailstorm considered outside the one that hit Denton, Texas a few years ago. It's considered one of the most expensive hailstorms. Um, it was throwing grapefruits and actually pummeling people's houses to pieces. Um, and it spread across the entire state uh, or most of the state. Thankfully, it hit a lot of rural areas where people don't live, a lot, of, a lot of pine trees, which is good. But the areas that it did hit, it just it would actually like blow the siding off of houses and blow out windows and it would take cars and look like somebody had like crushed them with a piece of equipment um it was incredible and so between all that it's just it's been it's been a busy spring every disaster relief group in the state and emergency management department is exhausted they're just gassed and we're heading into our secondary severe weather season so so yeah, that's how I got involved. That's how I got all the training. I looked for every opportunity I could, and that's uh, that's kind of where I'm at now. And and a lot of that training can it, it really crosses over. I mean, we talk about in the preparedness um, conversation or what have you. I guess the community, right? A lot of guys go straight towards rifles and and uh, small unit tactics and all this stuff, and uh, it in some ways people look at it and it doesn't really leave a whole lot of room for people that that aren't uh firearm centric. I think that this is like probably the greatest uh, example from what you said so far of all those skills having overlap, you know, outside of just shooting on the range and stuff. Uh, some of the stuff you talked about with that with the FEMA cert program, right? Med and comms are two big things that people talk about very closely with, Hey man, if you're going to build kit, if you're going to get into night vision, if you're going to do all this stuff, you should have basic rudimentary medical training. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, right? And you should know how to run comms to some degree. 
So the search and rescue piece, maybe not as closely related, but certainly I'm sure there's elements of that, right? That the carry over between these two. And I, I mean, I think it's cool if, you know, you and your friends want to get together and you maybe have some people in the group who are less firearm oriented, it still gives you an opportunity to work on a lot of these things. And it carries the benefit of being something that can, you know, act practically be applied and be tremendously helpful to your community. Um, when you were going through the training, what are some of the, like, let's, let's look at like maybe medical or, or I guess the comms piece too. Is it, I don't want to say it's not, it, it probably isn't overly complicated because you're not doing surgery. Obviously you're just stabilizing, I would assume, but um, what does that look like from, from that program's perspective and what they really look for with people that are volunteering to help during these kinds of events? They look for people that can endure and manage a crisis. People that have a, just have a unique skill set that you're not going to learn in college. You're not even born with. You kind of learn through osmosis, through through the, the people you surround yourself with. And I feel like the military does a really good job of training people. Um, but in the civilian world, um, EMS of all types, whether it be medical, uh, firefighter, cop, um, first res- you know, any type of first responder, those folks really learn how to manage crisis with a clear head. So it's just exposure to it. It's being around people and then it's actually living through it. And that is, they, they really seek out people that have that unique skill set. And I'll get into some of that when I share kind of the day of what happened with the tornado, but it's just this, it's this mindset that takes time to, to learn. And I think as far as, you know, big takeaways from it. So the final day, they set up a scenario. This is really cool. And, and I feel, I feel comfortable talking about all the details because the program actually unfortunately got defunded. It doesn't exist anymore, which I'm really sad. Um, there it exists in other counties in the state, but this particular county um, has experienced every type of natural disaster minus nuclear in the last 15 years. And that's why I went to take the training. I knew that guys, they, like even an oil spill they had experienced, even a tropical storm. And so they, uh, I knew the training I was going to get was just going to be top notch. So they, they get with a local community or not community college, local four-year university, a reputable four-year university um, that actually has uh, masters and PhD programs. And they reached out to the theater department and said, Hey, we're setting the scenario where we are setting up an earthquake in Arkansas. All of our EMS training for years has been centered around the new Madrid fault, um, which is, which, Last went off in 1819, caused the Mississippi to flow backwards. It devastated St. Louis, Memphis, all that. They, that is a big worry around here. The ground shakes every once in a while. Um, a lot of that is typically from fracking. Still don't care. I'm pro fracking. Um, <laughs> give me cheap oil and natural gas. But like it does in California, and, and we are worried that when the New Madrid fault decides to shake, the big one, it's going to be bad. So we, we, re- we did a, an earthquake simulation. So all of these makeup artists and actors come in from the local university and they set up this giant warehouse. They turn out all the lights, they put strobes, they throw trash everywhere. And they have these wounds on these people that look like, you know, they actually have like fake bones sticking out of people, et cetera. The That's coolest thing ever. And so cool. And so you're lined up at the, you're lined up at the doors and you're told what the scenario is and you have your assigned leader. You've got, you've got your unit ready to go. You've got your crew and you walk in, you have no idea what you're walking into. So I walk in this thing and there are people screaming, there's strobes, there's stuff getting thrown everywhere. You can hardly see you're having to use a flashlight. You're having to communicate. We're not allowed to use radios or anything like that. We had to communicate um, within earshot. And we had to learn how to triage. We had to learn, like, I, the, the one mistake I made was I stepped on a live wire. Um, it wasn't actually live, but the, the instructor goes, and you would have been fried. Um, it was so cool. You can't get that training anywhere else. And I just remember the, the instructor came up to me afterwards, came up to my, my team. He said, hey, y'all did the best on anybody. And he said, that was because you didn't focus on the people that were screaming and loud. You focused on the people that weren't. And those are the people that were actually injured. Those are the folks you needed to triage. And y'all made a, y'all did a good job of taking good notes and communicating. 
Um, and we had, we had cheated the week before we put some extra things in our bags that we thought we'd, we would need to help us out. Um, because we had a little bit of disaster relief experience. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, I, that was, that was good. I really enjoyed that. And I, I think as far as training, you just kind of got to seek it out. Um, a lot of it's going to be on Facebook. I know old school, uh, only old people use Facebook, but guess what? Old people are the ones that are teaching these classes because they have the knowledge. So go, go take it because they all won't be around forever. And that knowledge dies with them. A lot of people our age are not learning how to do search and rescue. They're not learning how to do disaster relief, disaster management. Um, learn how f- require but- them to the house. And most kids these days don't, uh, unfortunately. And that's probably only a small part of it. But uh, having just spent a week teaching high schoolers uh, at a band camp and seeing how these children reacted to like <laughs> more than moderate exposure to even just sunlight was like very telling with how uh how weak some of these kids are so yeah i mean it's it it, it's like up here in michigan we have a big deer hunting uh culture and stuff too and hunting here is taking such a nosedive and it's because people aren't going outside anymore and these are the kinds of things that get lost and everyone thinks it's just recreational but like i mean quite obviously right that's not the only consideration that needs to be looked at um but yeah sorry yeah go go ahead uh didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, no. Thanks for adding that. Um, Arkansas is the same way. We have a we have a popular hunting culture here as well. Um, I'm not going to say it's dying. It's pretty stable right now, but we got to add people for it to grow. So we, um, in, in Arkansas uniquely, we have access to so many resources because we are still rural enough that, you know, if you can get your kids out in front of a screen and the internet, there's not a lot to do. So people will go find things to do. And that helps. You know, people make fun of that. I'm sorry, but I like that. That's a big draw to living in Arkansas. And so it means you can go learn anything. So I really encourage folks to look around you um, and learn how, learn what groups are out there, learn what they're doing and see how you can get involved. Pick one. So I challenge you, I pick one. I, what I did was I picked all of them. Uh, minus search and rescue. I picked, I picked all of them. Now I take that back. I ended up doing search and rescue too. Um, but I, I did all of them and, and I got, man, I got overwhelmed. I was tired. Um, I, it was two years of just every weekend, a lot of my evenings. Now, again, I'm thankful for that, but for me, I've definitely narrowed in on more of the chainsaw flood relief, ice storm stuff. That's more where work and, and access to materials, et cetera. But yeah, I encourage people to get out there and find that training around you. And again, we're going to touch on this every time I'm on a podcast, we talk about community. Hey, I'm trying to find guys and girls that are like me and, you know, want to do this kind of stuff, et cetera. You know, some of the people in my disaster relief training group are from that CERT class. And there's more from Southern Baptist Disaster Relief. That's actually how I met some of the people was through those groups. And they're like-minded. In fact, I... I'm actually embarrassed to say I, I did not follow up with a lot of people from my cert class who who would have really put me ahead of the game. And I would have learned a lot of stuff years ago that I'm just now learning in the last three to five years. So I I, I really encourage folks, go look some of those organizations up. Um, I might post about some that that would give folks some resources, but you know, do do them do them your free time, even some just the online stuff you'll learn how everything works and you'll get access to what is oftentimes free training, or if it costs something, we're talking about under $50. I mean, it, and, and a lot of times they have free meals. So there's a period of my life. Some of these trainings I did because I was poor and I needed to eat. So I was like, Hey, they're having a you know hot dog night. Okay, cool. Well, I'll go learn about, you know, how to put a boot, you know, put a band aid on somebody. It means getting a free meal. So well, and, and it's just, it's funny that, you know, for all the bashing that a lot of people want to do on organized religion and churches and things in this country, just this, the state of way things are right. But man, all but like one of those organizations that you just mentioned is religiously uh, funded, driven, managed, I don't know what the term is, right? Uh, but they're all through churches. You know, those are positive things that organized religion, whether you're, you know, Mennonite or Baptist or Catholic, you know, whatever, right? Those are the good things that come from this because I feel like, you know, 
mainstream media does such a great job of talking about how awful religion is, uh, which used to be something that we we strove for in this country, right? But um, I digress, right? <laughs> it is cool to hear that, you know, that's, and it can also help drive people to churches, which I think is a good thing. I think more more faith and uh, morality is only going to gonna help, you know, the situation that we're in right now, culturally anyway. Well, faith-based, faith, I wasn't getting this later, but you mean, you gave me the perfect segue. Faith-based organizations are the backbone of a lot of this. Now there's some stuff that's government, et cetera, that's, you know, like FEMA does the CERT program, but all those people that volunteer are typically a member of their local church and really active with their local church. I saw during the tornado religious organizations, whether it be churches or religiously affiliated like Samaritan's Purse, another fantastic organization. Those, those groups do this because people like me and other people generously give to our local churches. That's actually the only thing I donate to our local religious organizations because they do stuff. But I want to share something that makes that challenging. Um, I'm not going to sit here and proselytize, you know, slide in the DMs and we can chat religion any day. It's one of my favorite subjects. But I will say I learned something about religious organizations in this last tornado that frankly has infuriated me and was really disappointing. And that is that most large corporations will not donate to religious religious organizations. Um, Our church that has a 5013C nonprofit because we are religiously affiliated. We were told by um, unnamed large companies, because I don't want to get sued, um, that they would not donate to us um, because we, uh, we have a belief system that does not align with theirs. And, and we're talking about like, I would call them and I would say, like one organization I called and I said, we are literally out of food and we have 50 people in line that need food. What can you do for us? Um, that said, I will tell you, there is one organization, one, you know, corporate global organization that stood out and that is Amazon. And I cannot believe I'm about to praise Amazon. Amazon, every step of the way, even before the disaster and after the disaster, when it comes to donating stuff and helping out our church's community center and other, I've heard this from other churches too, man, Amazon crushes it. And hear me out. I do not agree with their corporate policies. I do not agree with what they do. I think they hurt small businesses. Um, They push agendas that I don't agree with. That said, um, there was no other organization, not even Walmart, who is from our state that was uh, parking six semi trucks outside of our community center. But Amazon was. And all we had to tell them was we need X and we got X and we got pallets of it. Um, if I ever have to see hand sanitizer again, kill me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's amazing. I, I would not have guessed, honestly. There, and you know, anybody listening who works in corporate America, you know, you know the the way things are right now. The the uh, DEI movement, right? Diversity, equity mm-hmm. movement has basically driven a lot of companies to a point of they just they 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 want nothing to do with with religion um anything that can be can even be remotely misconstrued right as right wing ideal um and that can, that's religion unfortunately that like that's that's that seen as conservative so a lot of companies want to put as much distance between themselves and those groups um and i mean we all we watch the news like the big companies amazon google and stuff they're at the forefront of that stuff um some would argue, not necessarily myself, but some would argue that's how they got to be as successful as they are in the, in the recent years. Um, so that is very surprising to me to hear that. I mean, it's cool. I'm I'm really happy to hear that, but yeah, I'm very shocked uh, and also shocked about the, about the Walmart bit, especially because that's like you can't write that kind of publicity. Oh, hey, we're from here where we take care of home like we are Arkansas. Like, I mean, th- as cheesy as it is to to you know capitalize on a tragedy like that, um, some of the biggest companies in the world are pros at leveraging those disasters for profit. It seems like that they would have been the first one to jump on that. So it is a little bit uh, that is a little shocking. 
Yeah, I will say Sam's Club, which is obviously affiliated with Walmart, um, did, man, they were clutch. They came through big for us, and I really appreciate that. Um, but Walmart eventually donated, and they eventually helped out organizations, but uh, they took their sweet time. Um, and I've heard from Amazon corporate, I got some friends that are in Amazon corporate. I've heard that that is something they're pushing. They're wanting to get more involved in disaster relief on the local level. And they actually store, I think I can say this. They actually store, uh, like the top 1000 or it's 100 or 1000 items they believe will be needed in natural disaster at all their DCs, their, their distribution centers. So we have three DCs in Little Rock, uh, in a Little Rock adjacent area. And they have committed to being, I think their goal is like they get disaster relief stuff to or the right organizations within 24 hours, which is incredible. Um, but yeah, I was, I was surprised by that. Like DEI, we laugh about it and we make fun of it, but DEI has, is now, it's now being felt and I, and I am feeling it now and, and it, I'm more angry about it. I am more against it than ever before because I watched people not being helped and, and, I, and, I'll, and I'll use this one example and then we'll, we'll pop the next topic. But um, I, have a, I have a guy in my neighborhood. He is, he is gay. He is married to another man. And he is also a drag queen. And he and I have very different perspectives in the world. And my church does not agree with his lifestyle. But he, every single time that he and his partner came to our church, they were given everything that they needed. He told me recently, we were hanging out recently, and he said, your church has forever changed my mindset of how I view organized religion. And he says, they have been nothing but kind to, to me and other people that live my type of lifestyle. And he says, my, my, my partner and I now are actually, uh, we, we donate every month to your food pantry. Um, and I was like, man, that's, that's really cool because yeah. yes, my church has its belief system and, and we're not going to waver from that. But at the end of the day, we're going to help everybody. And we're going to love everybody, regardless of you know race, religion, creed, etc. And and we we practice that. And so I want people to remember that um, when that the the little the little local Baptist church or you know uh, Catholic church or whatever, um, they're they're the best resource you got. And if you don't support them, if they die, if they go away, like what's happening in a lot of rural communities, you lose a big part of that disaster relief, that community building component. Yeah, I mean the things that you kind of, the the little things. Oh, you know, I retract that because it's not really a little thing, but it's the the things that you take for granted because we don't live in a constant state of disaster, so you're not you're not uh, constantly aware that that uh, that component of the church exists, that the community support component exists. I mean, if you think about it you know, you, you acknowledge that it's there. Right. But it's always in the back of your brain. It's never at the forefront. You just, you drive by the church and, Oh, Hey, there's a church. You just you think you don't, you know, you don't think about it. And when those institutions close their doors, you know, like you, people don't realize you're going to feel the impact of that in your community. Whether that means you see more homeless people around because that church maybe ran a soup kitchen or something. Uh, you, you're you're going to feel that impact. Um, and, and again, kind of like the story you just told there, you don't have to be a practicing, uh, you know, member of the church, but donate to it, uh, support them at the very least. Don't oppose them. Don't be one of these people that goes out and goes out of your way to make life harder for folks. Like, come on, be a decent human. But at any rate, yeah, I, I think that says an awful lot for, for those kinds of organizations and groups. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, you're going to turn somebody away in a time of need, you know, that's, <laughs> They, only certain left wing groups do that stuff and then scream about it. Mm. On, but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I promise I will not digress into that because I could talk for hours. But but yeah, it was it was cool, man. It was cool to see how that how that um, how that kind of all played out. I know we talked about earlier. I'll kind of go into transition out of that into day of. You know what the day of the tornado looked like. Um, because it was, it was wild. So story start with no shit there. I was. Yeah, <laughs> not quite actually, but let me tell you, it was, it was terrifying. Um, so they had said that day we were under a, what's called a PDS, a particular dangerous situation, which is issued by the NOAA weather service. Um, the different regions were in region six here in Arkansas 
they issued a PDS. Uh, it was like a moderate, maybe a high chance of tornadoes, large, violent, long track tornadoes. I'm friends with a few of our local meteorologists because I nerd out completely about weather. It's pretty much why Twitter exists um, in my world. That's all I use it for is talking to our local weather guys, many of who I'm like 10 years older. And I'm like, oh, man, I can't wait to bump into you in the grocery store. But I I was I was really falling it close and they were just all they were all sounding the alarm. This is going to this is the one like this is this is 2014. This is 2008. These are the, this is the big one and it's going to be really bad. And I was like, you know what? Okay, sweet. I'm going to listen. Um, I packed all my gear. I, I went ahead and planned. I, I only worked part of that morning and then I planned I, I, this time of year, I was just getting to my busy season at work. So I normally took off Fridays, especially if I knew there's going to be rain. It rains on Fridays a lot around here. I don't know why, but I, had a trailer with some equipment that I was dropping off at uh, one of my training group guys' house and uh, dumped that off. And I remember hearing tornado warning and it's for my area. And I get on the interstate and I notice, and this is relevant to the story, my truck was having a lot of issues. I, it would end up blowing up its engine about two weeks later. I brand, almost brand new truck. Um, don't buy Fords. But I... Uh, I had, I'd be getting on the interstate and I noticed I'm following a storm tracker. I have my phone up on my dashboard. I'm following the storm tracker. And he's, he's following the storm. It's coming into Metro Little Rock. And he's like, this is bad. And then he goes, I see, I see a funnel cloud. I see, and then it's like five seconds later, I see debris. Um, I see massive debris. He's like, this is, this is a monster tornado on the ground. He says, there are, there are like homes in the air kind of a deal. And I'm like, Oh man. And he calls out on air, the street that my brother lives on. And I knew my brother was at home alone with his three kids because my sister-in-law was out of town. And so I, I get on the interstate and all the cop cars are going the same direction with their lights on at 90, 95 miles an hour. And I knew in the back of my head, I'm only, I'm only about I'm only about five to eight minutes away from the tornado warned area. And I tailgate these cops. I mean, I, I, this was as fast as my truck would go. I was doing 95 flashers on, like I have to get there. Um, I have to get to my brother. And then they call out my neighborhood and I'm like, Oh man. Oh, man. And so I get, I get off the interstate the, my, my favorite local weatherman, I put him on, I stream him, I'm streaming him on Twitter. I stream him and he's like, this is a huge violent tornado. Tons of people trapped. I'm, I'm literally two minutes behind the tornado. Um, and I get to my church, which is like right next to my house. I get to my church and there's a police, a police car just pulled out to do a roadblock and I whip around him. And then I, I'm coming up the street to get to my street and there's cars all backed up and I'm like, don't have time for it. And I go down people's driveways. I took out sh- or down people's front front yards. I took out shrubs. Um, I went around a police barricade and because I said, I have to get to my house. Um, Cause at this point I, I've heard that my brother's okay. As far as I know. Mm-hmm. Um, but now nobody knows if I'm okay. So I get to my street and it's just trees all across the road, everywhere, including uh, an elderly lady that I helped take care of. Um, she has trees all over her house, um, but they they end up not hitting her house. So I start driving my truck <laughs> over 45-year-old oak trees. I don't know how I didn't tear my suspension, but I mean, I'm hauling down my street. And I finally get to the bottom. I finally get about halfway through my street, and it's trees and houses, people screaming, and all I can smell is gas. And it's pouring rain, so the street's flooding because all of the drains are filled with tree debris. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and this at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm at that at that time I was married, and so I'm streaming or I'm uh, Facetime with my wife because she can actually see the tornado from downtown because she worked in one of the high rise buildings and she can see it. And so, and she worked for a government entity, and they were in the, very curious about what was going on because they needed to know what their response was going to be. And I'm, I'm FaceTiming with her and, and listen, man, I'm, I am man enough to admit, I, I lose my cool for a minute because I'm thinking this is going to be bad. Like I'm going to have a house. 
you know, my nods, you know, my chickens, you know, all right. this kind of stuff. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have a house. Right, vision. You know, what's going to happen to my nods? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, was, I need all this stuff. The world is ending. Um, so I, I run through Flood Street. I get drenched. I had to park my truck. And, and my truck is my base station. It's got my, a lot of my gear in it. Um, mm-hmm. I'm yelling at my neighbors. I like, get inside, all this kind of stuff. And I get to my house. My house is fine that I know of. I see stuff blowing everywhere. But, like, I don't see parts of my house missing. There's not a lot of trees down. Like, I'm, I should be good. So I run into my house, check on my dog. He's good. Power's out, obviously. And the cell network is just fried at this point. Like, I can't get calls through. So I collect all, I left my search and rescue bag packed and I would, I would, I would check it every year. I grab my night vision because I'm figuring I'm going to be out because this is like, at this point, it's about two o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm yeah. thinking I'm going to be out all night. Um, and so I grab night vision, disaster relief bag, uh, of course my helmet because I know I'm going to be in houses that are damaged, mm-hmm. um, all the gear that I can physically carry and I waterproof myself. I put all my rain gear, my boots on. My neighbor drives me down the bottom of the hill because obviously I don't have a vehicle. And I run a mile across the worst of the tornado. I run through our park, um, cross a bridge, hop in trees, uh, over power lines. But I knew that most power lines and storms, when they fall, and it's something like a tornado, a violent storm, they automatically shut off. Um, Never assume that, but that is the case most of the time. So just know that moving forward. Um, and I'm able to FaceTime my sister, who is an ER trauma nurse practitioner at our state hospital, our large state medical hospital, okay. um, our university hospital. And she's saying, hey, we're, we're all being recalled into work. She's saying, you know, th- th- what's going on? And, man, I, I would lose it at this point. I mean, I'm like, I'm cresting the hill and I just bawling like... And I just tell her, I'm like, I'm going to see hundreds of injured people and potentially hundreds of bodies. And I was like, this is going to be like the heart. I, I remember telling her, I was like, this is going to be the hardest day of my life. Um, Cause I'm exhausted already. Cause I mean, I'm, I was, I full out sprinted and keep in mind, I got like 30 pounds of gear on. And I get to the top of the hill and I hear people screaming, where's my mom? You know, screaming, like one lady was screaming for her husband. Um, and he comes like out of the rubble like a mummy almost and you know he's he's a a short dude and um oh man dude the hard one i'm not emotional about animals like animals are animals but i just i saw this lady her husband was up okay he was at work she was screaming because her dog was trapped and i and i saw these three dudes like my age bare hands they're bloody man their hands are covered in blood and they are clawing and pulling these two by fours and stuff out trying to get this lady's dog. Um, unfortunately that dog did not make it. Um, Bad. but I go find, tough. I go find the little, yeah, it was, ugh, it was tough. A lot of, a lot of pets died. Unfortunately, they were, that's the only thing that died. No people died. No people died. Well, I do not know how good. Yeah. But it's still sad. I mean, it's for a lot of, I mean, like, I don't have kids, but I do have two dogs and one of them's a pretty big asshole, but I still love them. And if something were to happen, I would probably be beside myself. Yeah, it'd be pretty tough. Well, we get to the top of the hill, and I know that my friend, a guy that I used to go to church with, um, owns the business that has been devastated. He actually would have a really cool video. Um, he recorded the point of hitting the business. And yeah, you know, I'm yelling at him, Mike, Mike, you know, are, are you okay? Are you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, what about the business? He's like, it's a total loss. And then I run up to some police officers, and I see our local fire station. So I'm in a cool neighborhood. I'm in a suburban neighborhood surrounded by green belts in my church. But my church, my pharmacy, my physical therapy, a lot of my favorite restaurants, um, our fire station, uh, school for uh, disabled kids where I'll actually be working here soon. Um, all these things are like walking distance from my house. It's really cool. It's like one of the few parts of Little Rock that's walkable. And I get to our fire station and I see the entire roof collapsed on top of the engines. And I'm oh. like, well, that's bad. Like, yeah, that's really bad. It, and I see the cell tower in the distance bent over. Also, I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah. this is literally the worst case scenario. So at this point, when I get up there, it's been only 30 minutes after the tornado hit. And uh, our entire police and search and rescue command was down. Um, both communications were messed up, but our command structure 
is not great. And I don't care about saying that publicly. Come find me. Um, because our, our on the ground patrol officers crushed it. A whole bunch of kids, like 10 years younger than me, that were fresh out of school or had only been on the street for two or three years, um, led the recovery effort. Um, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. Uh-huh. Um, off officers, EMS, firefighters in their street clothes with a radio came running. Some of them came running from their neighborhood a mile or two away to come help. Um, I ran to one of my friends who's a firefighter. And he and goes, Trey, what are you doing here? Th- this is one of those times where like, it really highlights the importance of understanding how to use a radio. Like, and, and like really understand, not just how you know, press the button, talk here, but people want to shit on getting ham radio licenses and stuff. This, I think, is a prime example of why you should get one. Like the test isn't that hard in times of emergency. You don't even need to have the license. But if you don't have the license, the chances are you probably aren't that great at frequency jumping or, you know, coordinating or having the, the right, you know, supplies, antennas and batteries and things like that. So and, and sorry to cut you off again, but like, you know, I get so many people they are like, oh, well, you know, no one's going to catch me. I'll just run comms without a license. Like if you want to practice tactical comms, that's that's great. In times of emergency, you're going to need to know how to use even a, like a, a $15, $20 bail fang is going to be invaluable when the cell tower and everything else goes down because it has the ability to transmit if you know what you're doing. And, you know, good equipment, you know, a good antenna goes a long way. So I'm popping over that subject here in a minute because that comes up actually. Um, so I get to the top of the hill. I attach onto some uh, female police officers and they say, hey, we need to start pulling people out of, out of these townhomes. Like the game on. Uh, having a cop tell me to kick in a door is kind of weird, but I was like, I'll do it. That's awesome. So the first house I come to, she breaks out the window. She sees there's a young female and two dogs in there. And she says, she just goes, Trey, it smells like gas. And so I, I mule kicked the door in and um, the girl opens it right as I'm doing the last kick to crack it. So I end up like smash her in the face. I felt terrible. Um, she was so high from the gas that she was actually disoriented. Um, you could see the haze from the natural gas inside the house. Um, her dogs knew what was going on though, because they were racing to get out. So I grabbed these two huge, them while having my arm around this girl because she's having a full-blown you know anxiety panic attack she's in shock she doesn't know what's going on and so i grab her and I, i'm holding her two dogs and i'm like what's close that has water and it's sheltered and i was like the dealership there's a de- again this all does this sounds like pleasantville but there is a dealership also in my neighborhood it's small and, and i go i go take her down to the dealership walk up to the manager and i'm like hey you know, this lady lost her home. She's got dogs. She needs water. She's in shock. Can you take care of her? And he's kind of like, what am I supposed to do? And I was like, well, you're a shelter now. I don't really care. Figure it out. And because yeah. we're having to carry anybody else out because all the roads are closed. And EMS is in chaos and all the roads are blocked. And so I I, I carry her up or I, I walk her up there. I go back. I start searching homes. Um we find some folks that have, are having asthma attacks. So I go find EMS. Um, I'd actually taken all my asthma medicine out of my med pack, I'm kicking myself. I'd taken out my EpiPens, all kinds of stuff, because I was actually updating all of them. And I was going to do it that weekend. Um, I was actually heading, when the tornado hit, I was actually heading to my pharmacy to pick up a bunch of stuff. And thankfully, my pharmacy was not hit. They had stuff in the, in the, in the, in the parking lot. But yeah, I, I get to that point where I realize, okay, there's a lot of EMS. I think they're good. I need to figure out how to get my street cleared. And I'm able to get a call through to my group of guys I train with, like my brothers, my friends. Mm-hmm. I put it, this is the only time in my life they have all answered the phone at the same time. And we're all FaceTiming. It's it's blurry. And they're like, hey, how are you? Is your house hit, et cetera? Apparently, it doesn't come through that my house is not hit. So they think my house is hit. Um, but I tell them, I was like, this is the time. Drop everything. Grab the gear. It's yeah. game time. Like, I need you here. It's bad. Um, and everybody's like, cool. My brother drops off three young screaming children at my parents' house. 
my mom's <laughs> like, what am I supposed to do? And he's like, figure it out. Um, yeah. God bless you, mom and dad. You are amazing. Um, he hikes in, he hikes in a ton of gear, like a mile because he can't get in. Um, so he drives to a point, hikes in gear. I have friends, man, driving off interstates, running through fences, lying to police officers. Um, we create an infill and exfill and we, and we turn my house that's at the top of the hill into the base station. We get radios up because cell is not reliable. I start handing radios out. Thankfully, I left everything charged. I had everything programmed for the most part. We start handing all that out. And we, we start going to town, man. Um, I, I live a very organized lifestyle because I'm, you know, a little OCD. And so I start getting gear. Guys start showing up individually as they can get through. Our infill exfill, which is we used my church parking lot um, at, in the time after the storm, the hours after the storm, it got windy and a whole bunch of more trees fell. Actually blocked our infill exfill. And so the local police came to us and said, you guys seem organized. Can y'all help us cut away? And I was like, sure. Can you let all of our my guys through the checkpoints? If they say they're with, you know, Trey Rose and mom or they're coming to this address, can, can I count on you let them through? And they're like, done deal. If you can cut this road and clear it for our guys, that we'll helps. let you through. Yeah. It also helps that we're running um, – ah, this is a little OPSEC thing. We're running a, a certain type of radio that the U.S. military used to run. So yeah. they look – we look official. And we had National Guard guys coming up to us going, hey, uh, can you tell us where we need to go? We had police going, man, they would even check our credentials. They just wave us through. Like I, I just flashed the radio like, you're good. Um, but, man, we got to town. And that was kind of where it started. So radios, equipment, I called every dude I knew that had it had a, had one of my friends as a professional tree company. It's actually I was working with today. And he brings down the, the mother of all skid steers that's hooked up to run at night. And it was already loaded. And he brings his tree crew, um, a bunch of good old boys that look like they're Amish. And they all crunch protein all day and they were like lifting trees with their bare hands. Um, they're absolute testosterone filled animals. And we had a crew of like 15 dudes and we just rolled, man. Um, and that was 15 at the time. Like we traded out, we had a, I over 60 friends show up um, over the course of three days to do disaster relief. And we cleared our entire, my entire street, which is a mile and a half. We cleared the entire street in three and a half hours. And then we cleared about 75% of the driveways. And we came back the next day and cleared more driveways. And John Hoffman shared this story. And I, and I like to tattle on him, John, with uh, LARP Labs. Yep. He, uh, he was really confused. He's like, why are we clearing driveways? It's such a waste of time. I was like, well, people need to get their cars out. And he's like, well, why does that matter? And I was like, because if people can't park their cars somewhere, they park them on the street. And when they park them on the street, people with big equipment and trailers and energy trucks, et cetera, can't get through. And it was, I just remember looking at him, he was just like mind blown. Um, well, no, it's, but, but it's one of those things when you're like, you're looking at it for priority of work, you, 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 the, the driveway just seems, you know, like a, like a frivolous thing in, in all of the chaos. Right. Like until you can actually gain your, your bearings, right. Get your wits about you and just understand if you haven't been through it before, like you obviously have that, Hey, they're there for a reason. It's, it's an, it's a release valve for all the traffic on the street that is backing everything up. And John's a good dude. Um, but I'm totally going to give him some, some, uh, flack for that later. That's funny. No, he's, you know, and here's the other thing that we had to do. We actually had kids running around on bikes, stealing first responders and volunteers gear. And so John and some other guys, they were like, we're going to have to like run security. I'm like, we are going to have to run security. We're going to have to have dudes that sit with trucks. My deal was we coalesced everything around trucks because the rain was kind of coming on and off. So several mm -hmm. of us had trucks with toolbox beds or camper shells. And so we, co we coalesced around trucks. And those were kind of our base stations for all of our gear and they could kind of move with us. And so we had, we had crews that would guard stuff. We had crews that were charged like water, making sure everybody ate, um, making sure everybody was like feeling good. We had spotter crews. 
And then we had uh, equipment operators, guys with chainsaws and limb draggers. And then this was a bit of a new role for me to step into. It was more of like, I kind of like coordinated everything because I'm the guy that's like, yeah, give me a chainsaw. I'm going to be done and doing work. But this is one of those times where this is my neighborhood. I knew these people and I needed to kind of be the face of what was going on. And, and sometimes that meant sitting with an old lady in her front yard with my arm around her and she's crying and I'm going, Hey, I'm sorry, this is hard. And, and, and I, and I can't fix this for you, but we're going to do everything we can to uh, alleviate some of the things that sh- are stressing you. Yeah. Um, we, we rescued an old lady that had, had gone out to her car to get some air conditioning, charge her phone. And those winds I was talking about, uh, uh, crushed her car with trees and she was trapped and we, we found her. <laughs> um, and I remember just lots of panic, et cetera. And several of my buddies who were just awesome stepped in. One guy was like talking to her, Hey man, it's going to be okay. And you know, we were, we were getting creative about, we actually were able to get the tree off and not damage her car. So she actually had a working car, which is important because she lived on a fixed income. Yeah. Um, we were able, I mean, we were able to help every almost everybody that was affected in my neighborhood by the tornado and you know my neighborhood was cleaned up fast which meant that we got to go to other places that needed to help more um we did have to run security we ran we ran security pretty hardcore that night um the next night we didn't take it too serious because things got better what did that look like from a security perspective just because i think i mean people are probably curious about i'm curious about what that looks like in terms of just make sure people's, I mean, this disaster has already taken so much, right? And you're obviously wanting to not lose your gear so you can continue to help, but also make sure that people don't lose more to immoral assholes on, on bikes that are uh, trying to run off with shit. So, uh, if you could give a little information about that. Yeah, totally. So we, oh man, how's security look? It was different. Um, I'm going to give a shout out to Darcy. I'm not going to say the instructor's name because I don't think, uh, or the owner, because again, I want to respect that. But he teaches a class called Tusk. John Hoffman and I both took it together. We were actually in the same kind of like crew together. And Tusk is a phenomenal class. Um, I, I lived a version of, a, a light version of Tusk. And I have those skill sets because of what Darcy taught me. And I'm really, really grateful to that program and the the guy that owns it being willing to do what he does um, because there's a great deal of risk in teaching civilians what we learned. And I really appreciate him doing that. And so John and I kind of coalesced on that. We got some other guys that were, that were, we knew were really uniquely gifted. Everybody brought night vision, um, rifles, pistols, all that stuff. Little Rock is a violent place. Um, we have lacked good police presence for years now. Um, we were one of the places affected by the summer of love. Um, we lack a lot of leadership. And it, it, this was a period of time. I mean, it's still as bad. It's really bad right now. But I mean, in March, the, the crime had been bad. And we were hearing of looting everywhere. We were just getting so many reports of looting. And, and we were watching. Like we watched people steal our stuff. And so we decided we were going to patrol just my street and every guy just kind of let you know, run whatever gear they felt comfortable. So and most everybody ran like a, a covert chest rig or a, I, I like belt systems. I just ran a belt system because my big range jacket kind of covered everything. Mm-hmm. And I ran an overt rifle with overt night vision um, running around with an overt AR-15 in a disaster in Arkansas is not going to draw a lot of, uh, red flags it's pretty normal here <laughs> you know and it's normal during deer season it's it's legal too um we did i did make contact with our local police that were man the patrol and told them hey this is who we are we're going to be running nods and and not in guns and we're going to stick to our street um, but we're just going to kind of be a, a known visual presence and they were like cool thanks Let, thanks for letting us know Really? Call us if you shoot somebody, kind of a deal. Um, they had no problem with it because they were so they were so undermanned. That's Go awesome. Ahead. Said you can call us, uh, call us if you shoot somebody. It's like it's so great and so funny. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I told him I was like, hey, listen, I really plan on not shooting anybody. Uh, the funniest part of it was one of my neighbors who was out in his car charging his phone with his wife 
said his wife got startled because she sees all X fill out of my truck, you know, you know, we're bracking everything and getting our gear ready to go. It's, it's dark. And his, 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 he was like, yeah, my wife was like, honey, honey, there's some, there's some crazy white guys outside with guns. Like, what are they doing? And he goes, oh, that's, that's the guys who are doing all the storm cleanup. That's Trey from up the street. You know, like we're, we're, we're good. He's, he's probably out protecting the neighborhood. And he came to me a couple of weeks later. He says, man, we left our front door unlocked by accident and we were gone for a week and a half. He said, none of our stuff was missing. He said, I just want to say like, thank you for just those first two nights kind of running patrols. And, and I will say this, and it's something I'm really proud of. Our street had, and the cul-de-sacs has experienced zero looting the entirety of this disaster to this day. We are the only street in this part of Little Rock that has, has experienced no looting. Um, I'm going to say that it's going to happen tonight, but Hopefully. we, <laughs> yeah, but we didn't experience that because we're a close knit community. We all know each other, but we sent the message pretty strongly to, cause we had, and, and again, is this legal? I don't know. I don't care. Somebody come find me, whatever. Um, but I, we stopped cars. Um, I actually stopped one car of a bunch of young men, um, that uh, were in street clothes that had no business being on our street. And I remember walked up, banged on the hood, and they were all looking at their phones. I was like, hey, what y'all doing? Oh, man, we're trying to get to the McDonald's. I'm like, well, the McDonald's is, uh, got blown away. got hit by the tornado. Oh, really, man? They were like, we were running while there were some trees down. I was like, yeah, a, a tornado hit this. How did y'all get to the checkpoint? And, and they and, and they're like, well, you know, we're just trying to, we're just trying to get to McDonald's. And I was like, the way to McDonald's, is you're going to turn around this driveway, you're going to drive back the way you came, and you're not going to come back here. It's like, because if I see you back here, I'm going to call the police. Like, whoa, man, just like be cool, like, be cool, you know? And I was like, I'm being cool. My neighbor has been looted. I'm in charge of protecting my neighbors, many of you are elderly. And I said, so you're going to turn around, you're going to leave. Um, and I did that to 15 or 20 cars that day. I'd walk up, bang on the hood. Um, why are you here? What are you doing? You don't belong here. I, I don't, I know you don't live here. I've not seen you before, et cetera. Um, and I know for a fact, in fact, I found that one of those trucks later was a looter. Um, and I think he about crapped his pants when he saw I and another unnamed person uh, roll up on both sides with AR-15s asking questions. Um, and uh, I am not an intimidating looking person. I'm 5'8 and uh, shrimpy. Uh, but my buddy was because he was an ex-cop and you know, we, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much a, a pacifist. I, I desire to re, um, resolve conflict and uh, I do not want to live out everybody's LARPing dreams of getting in some glorious shootout. Uh, the legal bills are expensive and I really didn't want anything to do with that. Um, I, I love people and I, I value life, um, even the life of some people that probably don't deserve life. And so I really didn't want to be a hothead and, and we weren't, um, these are people I trusted, but yeah, man, that, that's kind of what that security looked like. Everybody ran something a little different, but night vision was a key part of it. And it really, it really helped and it added legitimacy. It didn't freak the neighbors out at all. Everybody was so cool with it. Um, and, and again, we didn't get looted. So. Yeah. Well, and uh, it's just, it's funny because you know I've been trying to convince my brother to spend the money on night vision, and he was close, and he just decided not to. He's, oh yeah, I saw this video from this guy on YouTube that you know when shit hits the fan, you're gonna have street lights and stuff in an urban setting anyways, so you really don't need night vision. And I'm like, okay, there's there's a bunch of things I could throw at you that will defeat that idea, and you know photonic barriers and things like if you have street lights on, but in the event of an actual crisis emergency where you lose power, i.e no infrastructure, no streetlights, then what? So I, and again, I, that's why I think that this disaster relief topic, right. It, it, it kind of bridges some of those gaps, you know, where people are like, Oh, well, why do I need night vision just to go to the range? Well, not just to go to the range. Maybe it's for other things like this. Right. And I'm just the security piece of it, but I'm sure if you're trying to do any kind of clearing work or anything at night, it's nice to at least have the option. If you're searching for people, you know, in uh, collapsed homes and things like that, to, to be able to see in the dark is a valuable tool, regardless of how you apply it. Um, so it's, 
I think if if anybody listening to this right and you're you're on you're trying to find some way to justify this beyond just uh LARPing with your friends and your kit, know that there are applications. And while they're very unfortunate, you'd probably be very I'm sure you guys were all very glad that you had access to such tools when you were working through all of this. No, absolutely. I'll just be honest, man. Everything, everything that we did, there were a few things we could have done a little bit better. Um, especially when the leaders first started. I think if we had been armed, um, I it is hard to be armed while also operating chainsaws and be safe. Um, and there was also a lot of people around. And so we, at that time, and so we didn't want to alarm folks, but I think if we had been armed and had kind of posted up somebody watching every gear initially, um, we would have been able to catch those looters. Um, I'm really disappointed that we weren't able to because I am friends with our attorney general and he was, he's a, he's a great, he's a great guy, big, big pro two a guy. And uh, he would have loved to prosecute those scumbags um, because he has prosecuted several um, who were taking advantage of people from the tornado. But, but yeah, man, every, every system, everything we had in place, all the training we've done for years, just a camaraderie. I mean, some of these, some of these guys and girls were just friends of mine that we just hung out and did stuff together and, 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 you know, broke bread and shared a beer and all that kind of stuff. They were good people that I had a, uh, I had a, an, a working knowledge of how they work. And I think us being able to do that together was really important. And I, it just, man, it just reaffirmed. I, I'm telling you, the, the tornado, I doubled down. <laughs> I doubled down all this kind of stuff. I started realizing there is value to, and I'm just, as a guy, I'm going to speak to guys, of guys getting together, suffering a little bit, whether that be an overnight hike with the gear or um, going to a buddy's house and cutting some trees or doing some shrub trimming for them or helping do house repairs. When you work together, you grow together. And when mm-hmm. you work together, you, you learn how other people see that you learn their viewpoint of, of how they approach problem solving. And I think that was really important for us was we had all, we all had that reputation and, you know, yes, as the theme is becoming with any kind of event we do, um, a lot of guys didn't know each other, but they all knew me. And I was kind of like that linchpin of, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll kind of pull us all together. And it was cool, man. It, it was cool. It, I'm, I am blessed. I do not deserve my friends. They, they moved heaven and hell to get to my house and to help people. They didn't know. Um, and let me tell you, when, when a tornado hits and you got that adrenaline kick in and you got a purpose, like my purpose is to actually save this person or to help this person. You don't need caffeine. You don't need drugs. You don't need sleep. You probably don't even need water. Um, you run on just this pure desire to help other people. And I watched my friends do stuff that I've never seen them do before. Um, they, they, they channeled some, they channeled some inner part of themselves that I don't think they get to tap much at all. I know I did. Um, I, I ran 48 hours and three hours of sleep and with a migraine on migraine drugs. Um, and I didn't even care because I was like, I have a purpose and my purpose is to help these people because if I don't do it, nobody else will. So, well, that's, it, it speaks to the importance of building a good like group and network and then a, a larger community, right? Like, like you said, a lot of these people are just friends, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, these aren't, don't have to be the guys that you're, you know, throwing rounds down range with uh, training, you know, once a month or every other weekend or whatever, but it speaks to, you know, it build relationships with good people, quality people that, have good ethics and good morals and are, are willing to help each other. And that that's really community. I mean, not everybody's got to be, you know, uh, a gunfighter or something, you know, there's, there's something to be said for having a diverse circle of friends and also being able to count on the people that you invest yourself in. Um, I feel like sometimes we're very much in this, this community, right? Like chasing those large uh, identities out on, on social media influencers. Oh, I talked to this guy. So somehow it's a status thing. It's like, well, is that person a good person? Are they going to drop everything to come help you? Are they even able to, you know, you're investing all this time and trying to attract their attention. They live on the other side of the country. 
what do you do about your local uh, community, your local connections? Something happens. Are they going to come help? Maybe. And if they can, that's, that's badass. But more than likely, they probably have their own stuff going on and they're not going to fly across the country to come to your aid. And you're going to wish that you had spent the time investing in good people. You know, it's an investment. You want to see some return on that. I mean, as awful as that kind of sounds, like you you don't want to be just spinning your wheels for awful folks and things. So, and, and I say that because I've, I've, I've dealt with that while trying to build, you know, a greater group, uh, a bigger circle of people I know I could reach out to when something like this goes on. We see it a lot, right? We see it with a lot of content right now. People, you know, the guys from Dirty Civilian, right? Oh, it was a bunch of dudes that got together uh, as friends. They trained and stuff, and now they're doing this whole thing. And everyone asks them, how do I find a group like that? And it's like, well, you got to look and you got to kind of invest yourself. And sometimes that means you just look at somebody and you say, see you later. And it is what it is. And sometimes you find some great people and you hold on to those. And this is why, right? Well, in, in, I'll say what a lot of other people don't say. And, and I think a big part of that is uh, stop being freaking weird. Like, that's just the biggest thing. Like, just stop being weird. You know, like, all you know, everybody that does is kind of. Come on. I mean, we just talked about night vision being awesome for a minute. Like, you might be asking. <laughs> I know I'm saying this as I'm, um, you know, wearing a Bucky shirt with a flower arrangement that I arranged earlier. So, you know, like I listen, there are a few people more quirky than I am, but I think the big thing is making understanding that in a natural disaster, every person that you do stuff with is not going to be a door kicker. Um, I had a lot of friends, especially on the second day that came out, and we didn't, we don't do gun stuff together. They're, they're not part of like my training crew, you know, or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. They, they were just, they were people that I've cut trees with for years. I used to split firewood with, or that I used to work at my church with, et cetera. I'll, I'll use this example too. And, but before I get to that, I'll say that building that community out looks different. Not all of your friends have to like the exact same thing that you do. I have some friends that they only enjoy getting together to do this one thing. But guess what? That one thing can come in handy in the event of a disaster. Nobody would have ever thought that um, kid I mentored, great kid, um, really am proud of where he is in life. He's just turned, I think he's about to turn 19. Um, he's a small engine uh, mechanic and he owns his own shop. Another one of my buddies does a lot of automotive work. You would never think that, that mattered in a disaster. Those dudes stayed so busy because we had vehicles and chainsaws and side by side on stuff breaking down left and right. All they did was fix stuff. You think they were valuable? Absolutely, they were valuable. Just because they, just because they they couldn't do search and rescue or cut up a tree, didn't mean that they didn't have value. You know, I, I use this example too. When you build a network, you you have to like you have to pour into that a little bit. You have to give. You have to give freely. Um, I've talked about this on another podcast too. Um, didn't really get to get into it as much as I wanted to, but and I won't hear. I'll just kind of touch on on the surface. But you have to be willing to give of yourself freely, expecting nothing in return. And I I, I watched this model by my parents and, and friends when I was young, and grandparents and all that. If I go over and help a buddy with a project at his house, it's not like. Well, I'm going to go help you with this project, and then I expect you to come help me do this. It's no, I'm going to go help you with this project because you and your wife just had a kid and you're exhausted. Or um, I know that finances are tight. Like, hey, let's, let's, let's see if we can do this a cheaper way. Or a lot of guys like to hang out with each other doing a project. I'm sorry, but hanging out drinking a beer and watching football, I love – hear me out. I love me some college football. I am yep. so I do not like watching six hours of college football every Saturday. I'm burned out. I did it for years. I worked in I worked in college sports for years. Tired of it. Um, I would much rather get together with a bunch of buddies and go shoot or till up a garden or play with their kids in the park or something like that. And I use this example. I I have a friend of mine that owns a, a local uh, excavating company, and his brother has a construction company. They're one of the bigger ones in Central Arkansas. And my pastor calls me up on Sunday morning after the tornado. So it happened Friday afternoon at 1.30, 2, 2 o'clock. Sunday morning, I get a call from my pastor. I'm planning to go to church. We were, we were going to hold like a little impromptu church service. I was going to go in all my gear. I had buddies staying at my house. 
We're going to go, you know, pray for storm cleanup, and then we're going to go right back at it. And he texts me and then calls me and goes, hey, I know you got guys at your house. Amazon's dropped off semi-trucks. I desperately need people to come over here and help our director unload stuff. And I was like, 10 minutes, we're there. And we're walking there because my church is back behind my house. So we get over there. We help out. I see more of my buddies from my Sunday school class and stuff showing up. It's so cool, man, to see a bunch of young guys just like stepping out and leading. And ha- I mean, one of them was literally in his pajamas. <laughs> um, but he was like, I heard there was a need. I just, I, I hopped in the car and I raced down here just to help for, you know, 30 minutes or an hour. And the director comes up to me and he goes, Hey, we're getting in and day with requests. It's supposed to rain tonight and everybody needs to get tarps on. He says, I've got like 30 tarp requests. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, we can Like, how are we going to? There's no way. I was like, you know what? I know a guy. So I call, I call one of my buddies. I say, hey, man, I we're getting tarp requests. And there are no tarps to be found in central Arkansas. Um, can you can you help me out? And he goes, he, I woke him up with my phone call. Because it was like 8 o'clock in the morning. And he goes, and he had been helping us the two days before. He goes, in 30 minutes, I'll be ready to go. It's like, what do you mean? He's like, in 30 minutes, I will be there ready to go. I was like, what about tarps? He says, I have boxes of them. I did hurricane relief in Florida last year. He says, I'm going to, and I'm going to shoot my brother a text. So I get over there. I meet up with him. He's got his toolbox bed, all the framing gear, uh, all that kind of stuff. His brother owns a roofing company, shows up with 15 employees, all these Hispanic guys that have roofed for their entire lives and, you know, can like walk on a 90 degree pitch angle. They're incredible. He pays them the entire day and we go around as two crews tarping i mean i still look out in some of the houses that are tarp those are our tarps guess what they're still holding too um for the most part but we we ran around all day tarping i mean we worked from 8 a.m till i think we finished up at 7 30 and that's only because we were running out of light man we were gassed and that guy's not into tactical stuff he's not into guns his brother's not into guns etc but because i had hung out with him in a church event and we had done a couple of landscape jobs together and really liked each other. We, uh, we had that, we had that connection. We had that, like we had that friendship and I was able to call on him and we made a difference for a lot of people. And that's not because I'm a great person. It's because he is. And because I knew the right person, I have no idea how to roof a house. I'm an, I'm an amateur, but I knew somebody that did. And it was, it was that over and over and over. My grandfather taught me this. He said, there's power and be able to pick up a phone and call the person that knows. And I did a lot of that. And man, I had to eat some crow because I used to make fun of my grandfather for that. I was like, no, those are the lazy people. The real people want to help and people get out of their hands. He goes, no, the real people are the people that know somebody and call them up and can get, I, I got like a thousand t-shirts for our, for our, um, for a bunch of the victims um, that didn't have clothes. We, I was able to make a call and we got uh, my, my brother, organize all the people at his workplace when we ran out of food like in the middle of the day we ran out of food one day and my brother shows up with his suv stacked and he's like i'm gonna i'm making three more trips you know kind of a deal um dude there's power in that man and stop thinking that everybody's gonna be a door kicker everybody's got to be you know like a clad multi-cam and the latest whatever and you know that's what matters hear me out like i'm all about that um i may or may not have picked up the new t-rex uh, t-rex uh, chest rig today um i love me some gear i uh, i really enjoy larping it's fun i see great deal of value in it because i had to live it in real life multiple times um but also making friends with people that maybe aren't into that they're just fun people to hang around because in a disaster it takes everybody and again you never know what phone call you're gonna have to make in a natural disaster yeah no it just it it it's when it highlights the importance of community above all else, you know, uh, having those connections and, uh, and, and being able to right to make that phone call, reach out to those people and, and know that you're not going to get some, you know, some worthless excuse. Oh, you know, I would love to, but, oh, I really, you know, they're genuinely going to, whatever they got going on, they're going to put it on hold because they know this is important and they're going to be there. And, and, you know, that's not, it's not super common in in today's world unfortunately it just isn't you know even those people that you you may be you may be great friends with them but if they're not 
if they're not that kind of person, they're not, they just aren't, you know, and they're not going to help. They would, they would expect the help, you know, that, well, I helped you with your car. So you got to come over here and help me with my wallpaper. I don't, I don't freaking know, you know, uh, but yeah, it highlights, uh, <clears throat> how, it's how important it is to be surrounded by good folks, you know, that come from all walks. Um, but man, this is, this has been awesome, dude. Like I, I, <laughs> I can't believe you get to like, well, it, it, I don't even want to say you get to live this. I mean, you do cause it's a cool experience and everything, but it's also really tragic, obviously that those are the circumstances, but uh, you know, I, for people listening, you know, I, I sincerely hope you, you got something from this, right. And maybe look out into some of those programs that you had mentioned earlier, because we need this. If it goes away, these churches close, these programs go away and everything, maybe not tomorrow and maybe not two years from now, but eventually soon uh, we could all be in a whole world of hurt, especially with summers like what we're having right now. Where, I mean, hell, every time you turn around, there's another tornado or flood or something crazy going on. Right. Yeah. I want to, I, I know we need to close it out because we've been yakking for way too long and I have a feeling that I, I can't believe people even want to like care about what I have to say. Um, but, but I think it's cool at the same time. I think one of a couple things I want to mention, um, there's kind of been a meme going around about the Maui wildfires of, you know, the people that defied the blockade and people that survived, et cetera. Um, there is such thing as moral, uh, moral defiance. And sometimes in certain circumstances, it is okay to not listen to the law or those in authority over you when, because, because as a believer, as a Christian, I believe that uh, God commands me to put life above all and others lives, um, not even my own. Um, and so uh, I, I've ran around that barricade and I drove through those people's front yards and you know, sorry to everybody, you know, thankfully that didn't leave ruts, but I did that because all I could think about, it wasn't my house. It wasn't saving my stuff, whatever. Let it all burn. I can, I can replace it. Um, all I could think about was all my neighbors and, and my friends going, I hope they're okay. Um, and I think, I think that is, that is really important. Um, there laws exist. We need to have a lawful society, but there is, there is good that can come. And I think that from, uh, you know, moral disobedience, and I think you have to have a really strong moral compass and a lot of maturity. Um, I know that 10 years ago, I could not have made that decision um, and, and it had been right. But I know now I can. I think the other thing I want to say, too, is uh, community matters. You're never going to know when you need it. Um, I've been through I went through a tornado, a truck breaking down, uh, an unwanted divorce of which I will not get into. But I've been through a lot in the last few months. And, man, I'm telling you, my community has showed up for me a lot in in hard ways and because it's been a hard it's ever since the tornado hit life has been really hard for me and not because i'm some kind of victim etc i mean i'll just i take it in stride um there are days that are hard there are days that are easy but i have had people come over and show loving kindness to me and and help me with even basic things like do my laundry and do my dishes because i haven't had time um because i've been battling all these other other different things and loan me a vehicle so i could i can make a living etc um, community is so much bigger than an actual disaster. It's so much bigger than without rule of law. It, 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 it means something in, in the daily stuff too. Um, when you're going through a really hard point in life, when, when you're battling illness and all this kind of stuff, like, like I have been, man, it matters. So find your people and, you know, I, I hate to term find your tribe. Like we're not, we're not native Americans. Um, but you know, go, go find a group of people, especially guys, man, go, just two, just go find two or three people that you can hang out with that you can call and they go and go, this is an emergency and I need you. And they're going to drop everything that can't happen all the time. That's got to be like a once yearly thing, especially if they're married with kids, but you need to have your people that you can call and go, this is an emergency or I'm going through something really hard right now. And I need somebody because if you don't have those people, I just tell you, man, life is lonely. It's really lonely without that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. Uh, it's you need people there when when things are good and when things are bad. I mean, you got you got good stuff going on. You want to share it with people. You got bad stuff going on. It always helps to have somebody to lean on, talk to, whatever. So, I, I, yeah, man, I I could not I could not agree more with that. Um, and I appreciate you coming on, man. I I appreciate you making the time to 
to share all this uh, with with the audience and and with me because I just think it's it's cool as hell. Um, and it's always good being able to sit down and talk with you and, and kind of catch up on stuff and and all this good stuff. Um, so I appreciate it, man. And I honestly I look forward to doing it again because it's just always uh always a really good conversation, really good time. And um, and believe it or not, a lot of people actually look forward to hearing what you have to say. So there's that too. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It is it is fun to share my unique part of the world and the stuff that I get to do. Would love to do it again. I, you never know what adventures I'm going to get myself into, um, especially now that I'm single. I'm going to get myself into a lot more adventures. Oh. Um, here's the hoping a bear doesn't eat me in in Montana next month. But you know, it's one of those things where I love I love to share my heart, and my passion, and my passion is being prepared um, for anything. So love it, enjoy it. And as always, if anybody's got questions about stuff, I'm finally, my life is finally getting back in control. I want to make some more posts on this stuff. I want to talk about it more, do some more Q and A's. If you got questions, you can always DM me. I love talking to random strangers on the internet. Um, and I even, I love even more meeting up with them and which happened this weekend. It happens almost every weekend right now. So I, uh, I'm always here to answer any questions if you got them. I'm not the world's expert. I don't know everything. Um, and I'm happy to see somebody else that knows more. But if there is something I know, always happy to share it. Absolutely, man. Great stuff. Great stuff. And obviously, I, I encourage anybody to reach out if you got questions. You're you're a much better uh, knowledge source on pretty much everything that we just talked about uh, than I am. So um, 100% reach out to Trey. But uh, man, it's been awesome. And Uh, We'll definitely be in touch. We'll do this again soon. Thanks, man. So uh, might have been a couple audio uh, hiccups in in that one. Uh, Just the the game you play with some of the Internet connection things as we're, you know, across the the continent from each other. But uh, at any rate, a really, really cool conversation with Trey. Uh, I always love the opportunity to sit down and talk with him. He's such a passionate guy about this stuff. And you can tell, you know, it really comes through when he's, when he's telling these stories and, uh, you know, he, for better or for worse, gets to live through these, just his part of the country. You know, I don't even know if they still call it tornado alley, but you can just, you can tell, right. He said it, they had three, four tornadoes and flooding that goes with it and the rains that go with it. And it's, uh, basically, uh, it's just a, it's a staple of life. You know, we don't always get to pick the, the good and the bad and, Um, he's chosen to embrace it. That's his home and he loves it. And I think it's really cool the way he has stepped into, uh, being a positive, uh, influence on his community and how he can help protect it and and care for it and build a network that's going to do those, those same things. So if you're somebody who's, you know, wanting to get involved in the prepared space, the survivalist space, um, that always has such like a, a negative connotation. Everybody just thinks we're just, you know, weirdos with a bunch of guns hunkered down in the basement collecting toilet paper and canned goods. Um, and, you know, those <laughs> those people certainly do exist uh, in our community. You can be a drastically impactful individual in, in this community, in this space, like Trey, right? And be none of those, no, none of those things, you mean a normal guy, uh, work on all these skills and they translate over from all, what a lot of us do on the flat range or when we're out training and stuff with things like night vision and, and communications and radios and stuff. So, uh, I, I always, I always look for <clears throat> those opportunities to, to bridge those gaps. Um, and, it, you know, and, and it seems somewhat obvious, but people still miss it, you know, like, Hey, you need comms and medical and, uh, search and rescue and st- you need those things you're you're far more likely to need those than you are you know squad based tactics and things like that doesn't I mean you shouldn't learn it no but the likelihood of us encountering some kind of natural disaster with a, b- a very bad storm i mean we hear about those things all the time right when we started this episode we were talking about everything that's going on in maui and on you know the southeast united states and the west coast you know got a freak hurricane that they usually they usually don't experience those things you know you're we hear about those kinds of natural disasters and those those horrible things we hear about those all the time they're a certainty the only thing that's uncertain is when and how bad so when we compare, you know, apples and oranges a little bit on this, but when we compare what skill set is more important, you know, there's a pretty solid argument to be made for some of these ancillary skill sets that we kind of brush to the side because it's not as cool as shooting guns. And I get that. I'm I'm really guilty of that as well. Um, but at any rate, it's it's nice to have somebody on who does kind of all of it. You know, Trey has been through the Tusk course at Darcy, which a lot of guys, you know, 
you know what that is and what that means. He goes out and he trains with these guys and he owns firearms, but he's also very passionate about the community side of things. And who knows, maybe that'll be a conversation. Maybe we just talk community. Uh, I, I do. I love talking with Trey. He's a, just a solid guy. And if any of you guys have had the opportunity to, to uh, converse with him, uh, you know, he's just a, a hell of a dude, just a, like a, a, just a great human being. <laughs> and if you haven't had the chance to talk to him and you got questions based off of what he shared, I encourage you guys, it's it's at tbomb08 on Instagram, reach out, shoot him a DM, see if you can get him on a phone call or something, and and pick his brain on whatever it is that you have questions on. He's, a, he's just that kind of guy. He looks forward to connecting with people and being helpful where he can, and uh, just just absolutely awesome. So I hope you guys really enjoyed the discussion. I, I sure did. Um, and I hope you also learned some things, uh, because that's really what we're doing here. You know, if you're if you're not a long time listener or maybe you are, and we just haven't, we've never talked about it. That was, that has always been the goal of this podcast, you know, is to learn for, for me to learn and in turn to share that with all of you. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there that, that you know, want to tell you things. They want to tell you how it's supposed to be. They want to tell you why they're right. I try not to do those things because I'm just a guy, you know, I never served. Uh, I was never in law enforcement. I don't, think that anything I do is any, uh, any great shakes by comparison to a lot of folks, but I do really enjoy hearing about it. I do really enjoy talking about it and I really enjoy learning about it. Uh, so, you know, that's what we're here for is to bring information to you. Some of it you may already know, some of it you may have no interest in, but we try to keep it fresh. We try to keep it relevant to things that are going on and, uh, and above all else, interesting and entertaining. So I hope you guys have enjoyed, uh, you know, this week's episode, we're working really hard to get some really good stuff lined up for you guys as we kind of head out into the decline of the calendar year, you know, as we roll out of summer and into fall. Got some really, really good stuff coming up for the team here, as well as for our guests that we have lined up over the next several weeks. So stay tuned. I think you guys are really, really going to dig it. But that is all I have for you this week. Thank you so much again. If you guys have listened to this point, uh, really, really appreciate it. Again, check out our Patreon. It's in our link tree on Instagram. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on the pod platforms. Those clicks, they don't require anything, and they help us tremendously. We appreciate your guys' support. And as always, you can check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash prepared underscore mindset underscore pod. But that's really it for me. I'm actually done now. So <clears throat> until next time, everybody, you guys uh, get out there, work hard, train smarter, and be prepared. <laughs>